Um, hello, everybody. I'm Leslie Aiello, and I'm talking to you today from Brooklyn, New York. It's a shame that we can't be together for this year's Osmond Hill lecture and for the PSGB meeting. It would have been lovely to reconnect with all of my old PSGB friends and to see what's happening with the Modern Association. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to receive the award this year. The reason is, is that it had been given to my uh, PhD advisor, who was the first Osmond Hill uh, awardee in 1978. Uh, he was Michael Day, and his lecture was on human evolution, fossils, and concepts. For th those of you who didn't know Michael, uh, he was president of PSGB from 1976 to 1979, and uh, he was at that point one of the world's leading authorities on the evolution of the hominid postcranium. And you see him here with uh, pictures of his analysis of the Lytoli footprints, uh, where he de de demonstrated that they had a human like uh, bipedal gait. Now, uh, today, what I want to talk to you about is the expensive tissue hypothesis. And it's now been 25 years since Peter Wheeler and I developed the hypothesis. Uh, it was published in Current Anthropology in 1995. And what I want to do today is talk about what the expensive tissue hypothesis is and how it was developed what's happened to it over the past 25 years, and how these changes have affected our interpretation of the evolution of humans and the human brain. Now, if we go back 25 years, the general pattern of human evolution wasn't much different than it is now. Although things have been highly complicated through the discovery of new fossils and more information about the species that we didn't know about at that time. Now, one important thing for the expensive tissue hypothesis is that 25 years ago, we knew very little about the postcranial evolution of the hominids. We had the Lucy skeleton that was discovered in the 1970s and the Narakatomi boy that was discovered in the 1980s. And what we naively thought at that time is that you basically had two postcranial patterns among the hominids. You had the Australopithecine pattern like Lucy that had very wide thorax, wide hips, short, short legs, long arms. Uh, this uh, contrasted with Homo erectus that had a very modern human-like body form, narrow trunk, uh, long legs, and relatively shorter arms. Now, one of the most important things about the discovery of Lucy was that it broke the earlier dogma that argued that the evolution of the brain was a feedback system. So if you were bipedal, this freed your hands for the use of tools. If you were using tools, you needed greater intelligence. And the tool use and brain size uh, feedback system was really the main hypothesis that was used to explain the evolution of the brain. Now, of course, with the discovery of Lucy, uh, we re re realized that uh, the evolution of bipedal locomotion uh, happened considerably before any change in the evolution of the brain size. So here you, you, you can see Lu Lu Lucy around uh, three million years ago, plus or minus. You don't have the increase in brain size until you come up to between two and 1.5 million years ago. Now, what this did was really kickstart an interest in what could be causing this radical evolution of brain size we see in the hominid lineage. Now, at that time, there were basically two main groups of hypotheses to explain the evolution of brain size. You had an, uh, the ecologically oriented hypothesis, and perhaps the most well-known one is the extractive foraging hypothesis where intelligence would be needed for the hominids to live in a particular environment. The second group of hypotheses were social brain hypotheses. 
and of course the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis and uh, Robin Dunbar's well-known social brain hypothesis. Now, all of these were explaining why or how, or primarily why the brain expanded. Uh, with Peter Wheeler, we took a different approach and we wanted to explain how the brain was able to evolve, not the selective pressures that might have caused or been involved in the evolution of that brain size. Now, what we were very impressed by was the Kleiber relationship of body size to basal met metabolic rate that showed that humans were really almost on the line that would be expected for a animal of our body size. And when you contrast this to the uh, allometry of body weight versus brain weight, you can see that uh, humans have a much larger brain size than would be expected. Now, what the mystery was, was where humans got the energy to support that extremely expensive large brain size. Now, uh, the expensive tissue hypothesis posits that you have a direct trade-off between the size of your gut or digestive system and the size of the brain. This chart shows uh, what the brain size and uh, gut size would be in a primate of our body size, contrasted to what we have, what we see in modern humans. So you, you have almost the perfect uh, payoff. And it turns out, of course, that guts are very expensive and energetically, as is brain size. Now, uh, what we uh, argued at the time was that in order to achieve a small gut, you needed to have a very high quality, easy to digest diet. And we suggested that that dietary change involved the increased incorporation of animal-based products in the diet. Now, I, in, in the paper, the expensive tissue hypothesis is basically a high quality diet. Uh, you have your reduced bulk, more rapid assimilation, resulting in a smaller gut, the energy is available uh, to support a larger brain. But we also argue that a higher quality diet could directly provide energy available to the brain. And then uh, in terms of why the brain may have evolved, the more complex foraging behavior feed it into uh, the evolution of the larger brain. Now, as ma ma many hypotheses, uh, this uh, general idea was in the air. And particularly Bill Leonard had two papers that were published at the time, one in 1992, one in 1994, arguing the importance of the high quality diet to the larger brain size. The unique factor of the, hum of the expensive tissue hypothesis is uh, this uh, route through the smaller gut making the increased energy available. It's also interesting that neither, neither Peter Wheel or I knew of Bill Leonard's work at the time. And of course, the, the, this was before online searches were uh, readily available to academics. Now, uh, what we tried to do is find ways of testing this hypothesis and to argue when this actually happened in human evolution. And here we come back to the postcranial skeletons that we have. And what we argued was that the small narrow thorax with the relatively little room for the expansive ape-like gut and therefore the evolution of the smaller gut must have happened uh, between the time the yo changed from the Australopithecine-like body form that was thought at the time to be characteristic of um, all of the Australopithecines and maybe even Homo habilis. So uh, the small digestive system would have evolved somewhere in this period between two and 1.5 million years ago and be documented by the Narikotomi skeleton. Now, uh, also we knew that there were stone tools and increased evidence of uh, hominid exploitation of animal-based sources at this time period. 
And of course, to today we know that we have some stone tools even earlier down in uh, the period older than 3 million years ago. But uh, what seemed to be happening is that you had a development of the reliance of animal-based food. And by the time you arrive at Homo erectus, uh, you had the system of the small gut, the re relatively larger brain size. Now, uh, of course, there is further evidence that's come up over the years, and particularly the Bramble and Lieberman endurance running hypothesis, which argued that many features of the skeleton actually showed evidence of adaptation to endurance running uh, that would have been useful in hunting behavior. Now, it, it wasn't only hominids that we uh, applied this to. Uh, we, we also thought that the hypothesis might gain more strength <clears throat> if it had a more general applicability. And we uh, analyzed the then available primate uh, brain size and gut mass data. And there was a nice negative relationship between primates with large brain size so that also had smaller guts <clears throat> and uh, those with large brain sizes that had larger guts. Now, uh, th th this was substantiated on our original data set by Eisler and Van Schaik in 2006, uh, using both residual analysis and also, um, <clears throat> and also independent contrast. Now, uh, this whole conclusion that it's, uh, the hypothesis has a more general applicability has probably been the one area that it's been most heavily criticized. Uh, before we sort of go on to look at, uh, at those criticisms and to see how the whole idea is de de developed, there are a few fun facts about the expensive tissue hypothesis. The first being is that uh, it was pointed out by Darwin in The Origin of the Species that uh, at least among domesticated species, you had an increased investment in one trait uh, that would tend to reduce the investment in other traits. Uh, a few, few decades later, Sir Arthur Keith uh, also pointed out that there was a reverse, an inverse relationship between brain size and stomach size in primates. And in 1950, he actually lamented the fact that the findings in this obscure paper of his uh, went entirely unsighted. Now, the next fun fact is that neither Peter Wheeler or I coined the term the expensive tissue hypothesis. It was coined by Alan Walker who, when I gave one of the first presentations of the hypothesis, and I believe this was in 1993 at the <clears throat> Anthropology Society meetings, he came up to me afterwards and said that idea needs a name. Why don't you call it the expensive tissue hypothesis? Now, uh, another fun fact is that my involvement with energetics and with the expensive tissue hypothesis was entirely fortuitous. Um, in the, um, I, uh, what one of my colleagues at University College London was Bob Martin, and he, together with Steve Jones and David Pilbeam, were editing the Cambridge Encyclopedia on Human Evolution, and they wanted somebody to do the entry on the energetics, and I think Bob um, chose me, uh, because my interest at the time was in postcranial evolution. And much of the primate energetic work at the time had to do with locomotor energetics. Uh, my uh, PhD thesis had been on the allometry of size and shape in human evolution. And of course, my true love was uh, comparative evolutionary anatomy. But through writing that paper, or, excuse, or writing the entry to the encyclopedia, uh, I realized that there was this problem with the BMR, the basal metabolic rate, and the increased uh, brain size. And th th this led to my collaboration with Peter Wheeler and the development of the hypothesis. 
Now, the last thing I wanted to mention was current anthropology, because at that time, uh, what I wanted was the hypothesis to reach a broader anthropological audience. But we had a horrible time getting the hypothesis published. Uh, the editor of current anthropology at that time was a social anthropologist who thought the idea was too scientific for an anthropological audience and would, um, and would be of no interest whatsoever. Uh, I got a little bit of revenge on this, in fact, in two ways, uh, because the expensive tissue hypothesis paper uh, was the most highly cited paper in current anthropology for many years. And also when I moved to the States to take over the Wintergren Foundation, I actually uh, was in the position of, <clears throat> of owning current anthropology because of course current anthropology uh, was um, developed and has been run by the Wintergren Foundation since its inception. Now, uh, what's it, it, interesting about it is the, the citations, because I, to date, it's been cited about uh, 2,500 times, and this is according to Google Scholar. But for the first decade or so, it was minimally cited. And in the last 10 or 15 years, it's averaged about 150 citations a year. But the great majority of these are critical of the hypothesis and point out its problems. Now, what's happened to it over the past 25 years? Uh, the great majority of the discussion about the expensive tissue hypothesis has involved other groups of animals, bats, birds, more work on primates, and also even fish and amphibians. Uh, the first main um, test of the expensive tissue hypothesis was by Kate Jones and Anne McLarnon, where they looked at 300 species of bats. And what they uh, discovered is rather than being a negative relationship between brain size and gut size in bats, there was a positive relationship. And what they uh, did was uh, also note that none of the other major hypotheses for brain size at the time were uh, supported in the bats, in particular the maternal energy hypothesis that was put forward by Bob Martin. And th this hypothesis suggested that an offspring's brain size was dependent on the maternal energetic status. Uh, so uh, th th this was uh, a little bit of a blow, but what, what one of the facts about uh, this analysis is that it relied on intestinal length rather than mass. And in primates, uh, intestinal length uh, also doesn't have an inverse relationship with um, body size. Now, what, what one very interesting thing is in a subsequent paper, that was published by Kate Jones and some of her colleagues, uh, they saw a very significant uh, relationship with brain size, but uh, not, not, not involving gut size. This involved testy size in bats. Now, uh, I didn't know that uh, bats had a tremendous variation in testy size. And those bat species that have promiscuous females uh, tend to be the species where the males, uh, well, in fact, both males and females, but it, 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 in the males, you have a uh, relatively small brain size that is traded off by the testy size. And in fact, in some bat species, the testy size can be twice the percentage of body weight as uh, the brain size is. So the, what, what this demonstrated is that you can have an organ trade-off with brain size. It doesn't necessarily have to be gut size. It depends on the species. Now, one uh, interesting thing about this is that uh, the explanation that was suggested was that this trade-off uh, occurred because of the very high metabolic cost of bat flight. And uh, this in the current context of the pandemic, where 
people who've looked at why bats can harbor uh, the viruses. Uh, it looks like one reason is, is again, because of their very high me metabolic costs in transportation. And they've evolved ways of reducing inflammation. And uh, these uh, have also allowed them to harbor the viruses, which wouldn't be sustainable in ma many other species. So you do have a trade-off here between organ and brain size. Now, the next ma major 